just so you know, yeah, I am a feature film editor. I've cut nine feature films, lots of short films, documentaries, music videos. And what I want to do this morning is show you my workflow, show you how I use Premiere Pro, and show you how it's used on the higher levels in Hollywood and you know around the country. And just to show you that, you know, some people are like, oh, Premiere Pro, you can't do long projects, you can't do feature films. Well, th that's not true. The last four films I've cut were all on Premiere Pro. So that just it goes to show there. Um, what I want to start with, with is I have three different projects that I worked on last year, a feature film, a documentary, and a music video. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is my workflow for Sharknado 2. If you haven't seen Sharknado 2, here's just a quick clip to show you what, it's, uh, what we're dealing with and if we get the audio up. Pretty much your normal movie. Um, sharks flying and whatnot, but uh, so <laughs> films don't have to be realistic. I think they just have to be entertaining, and this is definitely entertaining. There's some crazy things happening in this film. So just to show you that little clip, that's you know part of Sharknado 2. And the thing is, like with that film, four and a half million people saw it the day it opened, and the next day it opened in 86 countries around the world. Of the nine films I've done, that's the most visible. Like, the most people have seen that, so it's kind of nice to at least show you a little clip from that. Um, with this project, the reason I use Premiere Pro is because it's just very stable, it's very flexible. I can ingest any kind of footage from any Kodak, any camera, and do it in real time without rendering and just moving forward. With this Sharknado project, here's the actual timeline that I built for the whole film. And the whole timeline is on one timeline. So this is about an hour and a half long. This represents all my edit decisions. There is on the top of the screen, the pink stuff is all the video, and all the blue stuff is the audio. So we have literally, I like to build very deep with my audio, and the, the video is set up in a certain way that I'll demonstrate. Um, what most people don't realize with audio is I have to put in every shark crunch, every blood squirt, everything that you hear. Without that, it looks very empty. It sounds empty. It doesn't feel like a movie. And so with this timeline, I would say there's about 1,400 shots in the film. So that's 1,400 decisions I have to make each time, when to cut away, when to do what. If you, what's nice about the workflow here is if I zoom in, to keep everything organized, the, Video one, which is the first layer right here, that's only the decisions, that's only the shots that are being used that are at the base level. That's every shot that's just playing. And every level above, the pink layers, that represents a VFX shot that's being put in, some kind of blood effect or whatever. And every layer has a certain place because what we have to do is share the project with other team members. If I'm doing the edit, I have to pass it over to the video team so they all know where everything is. So the key to to doing a bigger project is being extremely organized. Without that, it'll fall apart. You won't be able to share it with other people. And today, like, we're always collaborating. It's very hard to do an, an entire feature film by yourself. It can be done, but I would say that people like to collaborate. It's nice. You, you, you should do that. And so keeping a project organized is the paramount goal as an editor so everyone else can work with the same project. So. With this project, what's interesting to note also is that this project started on Final Cut 7, which is a different editing platform. The entire company, the asylum that makes these movies, they make 20 movies like this every year. They work in another editing system. The way I cut is in Premiere Pro. So I had them send me an XML, which is a text file of all their information. I opened that in Premiere Pro, made all my decision edits. It took me about eight weeks to edit this film, and then I sent them back an XML that they opened on their end, and all my decisions for the film were there. So it's really nice that Premiere Pro, you can share between different platforms, it doesn't matter. It's just communication of like X's and O's and ones and zeros. So for me, it's the most powerful, but I can interact with any other platform, so you're not contained to, to just being like, oh, I only do Premiere Pro, and I can only cut on that. You can do anything you want. Um, with all these decisions being made here, over and over and over and over, 13, 1400 times. Here's a little something I want to just talk about. As a film editor, average film has 1300 cuts. Lord of the Rings, 
had 2,500 edits. Annie Hall, which won the Oscar back in the 70s, had 245 shots in it. So there's a wide variety. The average film these days have 1,300. What's important is every shot that you make, every decision you make, ripples through the whole project. So if you make a decision that's not correct early, it'll ripple down and won't make sense. We've all watched a movie, and at one point, everything's working, and all of a sudden, one bad cut happens, or one, something happens, and you're taken out of that moment, and it just ruins the movie for you. So I think it's really important to take pride and really invest yourself and that goes for not only film editing, but anything that you're doing. Try and make everything as perfect as you can because everything affects everything else around it. So as an editor, you have to be spot on and it's really difficult. Um, that said, with this card, that scene that I just showed you from, from Sharknado 2, that's the completed version. What most people never get to see is when I'm cutting it, what does it look like earlier? So let me show you. When I cut that scene, because we don't have those visual effects yet, we don't have the audio, it looks a little different, and we have to write stuff on the, on the screen. So let me show you what that same scene looks like without the, the final product. As you'll notice, I have to physically write these cards that say what is going to be on screen. I'm basically helping write the film because I have to share what the vision is going to be with everyone down the line. Like, you know, no one ever gets to see this, and I'm really happy to share it with you. I don't think anyone's seen this yet. I have to download shark images and put them into my project. I have to, you know, do this so you have the, the feeling of the rhythm and stuff. That looks a little different than the final image of a man going through a shark. And so I have to make all these decisions like this. And what's really important is the timing that it takes to do this. Um, without all the sounds there, look, he falls down, there's nothing even, uh, no one around him. What's interesting is like, I have to make the decisions of how long the shark is coming at him. How long is he flying through the air? I have to take into account how much blood is there going to be? Is there too much, too little? So all these decisions that you don't see in the final edit are done earlier, and that's what, that's what you usually you struggle with the most as an editor, how to make it perfect, how to make the timing right. So, and with Sharknado, um, that's the basic gist of, of that project. It, it, and again, it took me only eight weeks, which is really not a long time. Uh, usually feature films will be four months, five months, but the turnaround for that company is very fast and they want to get the product out, so you have to work you know, crazy long days and hopefully at the end of the day this one timeline is, is what goes out and hits air and makes broadcast and a lot of people can see it. So I'm really proud of that and that's, that's what a feature film project looks like when, you, when you're done. And it looks like a mess, but it's a lot of work obviously in, involved in there. Um, so that's, that's Sharknado to the sequel. And that said, I want to, I want to talk about, again, what, what is film editing? Um, what we're just talking about, there's three things to film editing, and that re goes on every platform that we're dealing with. Creation. You're literally taking pieces and parts of film, pieces and parts that someone else created in no specific order, and you're trying to make something coherent that makes sense, that affects you emotionally, and that's a creative process. And that also applies not only film editing, but anything that you do. Manipulation. Exactly what we edit and what we put up on the screen doesn't have to be true per se. My job as an editor is to manipulate your emotions, manipulate your heart, manipulate all sorts of things. If you cry at a movie, if you laugh at a movie, that moment has been created by someone, usually me or, or other editors, and it's really hard to make people emote because you're affecting them on an you know, emotional scale. It's, it's, it's difficult. Also with manipulation, if you watch any reality TV show, do you honestly think every moment is real in real time that happened? No, they're shooting stuff. They'll get someone saying something terrible one day, put it on top of another shot on another day. Someone will give a catty look, but they'll be from another day. So they're creating these dramatic moments out of pieces and parts. That's manipulation. And then juxtaposition, the last thing about editing is putting the right piece next to the right part continually. If you put two shots together and they don't work, if you flip them around, sometimes that will work. You never know. And it's all how everything sits together. And I think that can be applied across the board. No matter what we're doing, you have to find creative ways to make things work. So that's, that's what I want to talk about that. Now, that said, when my next project was a documentary, and we're going to have a, a little bit of a tone shift. This documentary that I'm going to share with you now, it's called That Which I Love Destroys Me. It's a, it's a documentary about PTSD. And we followed two special forces 
troops that were in both Iran and Afghanistan for 10 years, many, many tours. They came back both physically and mentally, emotionally ruined with PTSD. And it was a story of their struggle of how they reintegrated back into society. These guys come back oftentimes in one day from the battlefield. And when they go into society, into the real world, they, they don't know how to act. They can't flip that switch off of being hypersensitive, hyper alert. Everything around them was a threat on Monday. Now today they're back and they, no one can handle that. And it's, it's not their problem, it's not their fault that this is happening, but you know, it, this is the story of how, it, how they deal with it. The challenge with this documentary, which is what a lot of people are doing, is we shot this on about 12 different formats of camera and codec. And Premiere Pro is able to handle that without having to transcode that into some other codec. And then you're buying four terabyte drives to put all that footage in. And then you can't take it with you because you have this huge drive. Thanks to the power of Premiere Pro, I can just dump all the footage in. And we shot on, there's mini, like mini DV, old handy cams. There's Canon 5D footage. There's RED footage, which is 5K. There's GoPro footage. So pretty much any codec and any camera that's out there we use in this film because making a documentary is a pastiche. It's little pieces from everywhere. And we all do that. And even the small projects we make, we're like, oh, I need this camera, that. This YouTube clip goes in there. So I'd like to show you a piece of this and show you how we can integrate everything in real time and just drop it in to help tell the story. So here's just a quick clip from one of the guys in the documentary, That Which I Love Destroys Me. And here we go. And then a volume. I was the Delta Force operator. It was the tip of the spear. It was the most trained, best trained, highly elite unit. And we got the missions that I wanted to be a part of. We were the terrorist terrorists. We were the guys who found out who they were and then we're ambushing them on our terms. To go into his house while he's sleeping and wake him up with eight guns in his face was priceless. I mean, that's the most job satisfaction I could ever imagine. I think for guys like me that feel like they were born to be in the military, you know, kind of guys like the special operations guys, the reason they're so kind of messed up when they're older in a way, you hear it all the time. I never expected to live past 30, and uh, getting injured is the special operations way of quitting. Because that's the only thing that'll stop you. So obviously the tone of that is a lot different from the Sharknado 2, but the storytelling is the same. And those shots you saw were actually like from the Department of Defense. The green are the helmet cams from Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't think that's been shared before in a documentary, and they were kind enough to show that and share that with us so other people could see what these guys are going through. It's so different than what you envision and um, it was really amazing to share this. It took three years of filming to get to this point and the good news is that Participant Media purchased this film um, about four months ago so it'll be out in, in theaters soon. It premiered at the US Capitol building in Washington DC. It's one of the few films that had done that so we're really proud of that and it'll also be, I think it's on iTunes right now if you want to take a peek but it's it's a, quite a harrowing journey, and emotionally, it's hard to cut. It's hard to edit because you're looking at all the raw footage, and it's very, very painful sometimes. Um, one really cool thing about this project that comes back to Premiere Pro specifically is when participant purchased it, they said, we need to make a DCP. And if you don't know what a DCP is, it's a digital cinema package, which is the industry standard moving forward for HD delivery and it's projection. So when you go to a theater, you're watching a DCP. It comes in 2K and 4K flavors. And in the past, if you went to make a DCP, you'd have to make a master file, take it to a post house, and it would cost five, ten, or fifteen thousand dollars to make a DCP. In this last version of Premiere Pro, if I take my project and I go to export it, I have an option now, once this comes up, if I go to the format, I can pick Raptor DCP. That means now I can, for free, I can make a DCP right out of Premiere Pro, which is insane. When I told the producers, they're like, we have to make a DCP, find like the lowest guy, lowest price shop. I'm like, I can do better than lowest price. I can do it for free right out of our software and I can have it ready tomorrow. So they freaked out. So just knowing that you can make an industry standard 
highest end, high quality DCP that you can deliver that I delivered for distribution. So if anyone who sees the movie will see the DCP I created. Um, when I made that file, it was about 40 gigabytes. So it's not very big. A feature of film is usually about 100 gigabytes, a long, like, two-hour spectacle. I took that on a flash drive to Deluxe, which is a company, the post company in Hollywood that tests all the DCPs. And the one thing I was concerned about was quality control. If I turn that over this file, they're going to say, it's not good. It didn't pass. I took it there. It passed on the first time. And I was just like, wow, that's unbelievable. So to have that option inside my editing software is a real treat. And it saved us a lot of money and a lot of time. So that's where it lives, and you can choose the you know, different flavors there, but it's just a real treat. And what the greatest thing is even if you don't use Premiere Pro and you finish your film, you can always like rent, rent it for a month on the cloud, do your DCP, and then you're done. And you spent 39 bucks or whatever, 49 bucks to make your DCP. So just know that that's there, and it's a great, great addition to the, to the family. Um, the last piece I want to share with you guys is a music video that I, that I d edited it's for a band called the Pentatonix. They're an acapella band that are really popular on the internet. They have literally hundreds of millions of views. And this, this project was shot on Red 5K. They shot this in one day in, in uh, Los Angeles in Griffith Park. There's a cave where they shot the original Batman TV show in. And they shoot like every movie, every you know, commercial in there. So we only had it for an afternoon. We shot with two red cameras. We shot for five hours. I was given all the footage, native red 5K footage, and I, they said, you have two days to cut it before we put it out on air. I'm like, that's not a lot of time. All right, well, let, let's get started. So the issue was that because Premiere Pro is so powerful, I could cut the red files without transcoding. Had I had to transcode the five hours of footage, that would have taken overnight. I would have lost a day there. I would have started editing. I would only had one day, and then I would have to conform, which means get rid of the little files, reconnect the main files, then do color correction, that would take too long. With a two-day turnaround, I had to keep it native. I had to edit the raw files, and I could do it here in, in Premiere Pro without an issue. So that benefit alone makes it worth, worth its weight in gold. And as a, as a film editor, anytime I can save time and be more efficient, I'm going to take that route, and I'm going to use whatever software allows that for me to do. Here's just a quick clip from the, uh, the song, so you can just have a taste. And this is all red 5K, and it's been color corrected. So that's just a quick peek into it, but again, like shot in one day, you know, and then edited and, and put out. We put it out two days after I finished, and within like the first three months, there were 31 million views. So this video is like, is honestly the most viewed thing that I've worked on, and it was one of those projects that fall in your lap, you're done in two days, and then you get to share it with other people. And I, it's, it's really impressive and really happy, and I was just, you know, proud to be part of it, but I couldn't have done it without Premiere Pro, to be honest. Um, coming back to editing, uh, just a couple more points that I wanted to share with you. Um, this is really important as an editor, and again, it doesn't matter what editing software you're on, but the film editor must protect the actors. If the actors are performing badly or they're not doing good takes and you're looking at all the raw footage, you can't put that out there. You have to be selective. You have to protect them. You want to work with these people again, and they want to work with you. You hear the stories, oh, I love my editor. He makes me look so good. Yeah, we, we're trying to help them, you know, and that's important. You've got to protect the director. Sometimes the director doesn't know what the, knows the vision but doesn't know the final outcome. What is it supposed to be like? They have their own opinion on how should, the story should be told, and it's our job as editors to help guide them in the right direction. We make suggestions. Hopefully they accept our suggestions since we know a little bit about storytelling. And speaking of story, protect the story. Um, oftentimes there's lots of things that happen that you want to use in, in your final project, but it's not tone appropriate or just it's overkill or it's too much. One example of that is in the documentary about the PTSD, there were lots of moments where the soldiers got really emotional, shared such personal stories that 
if I chose to put that in, it really it would hurt them. It would be too much information. It would be too deep inside their soul. And by sharing that, I, would, I could say, oh, I'd make people cry. I'd, they'd be really emotional if they heard that, but I would lose the trust of those guys in the film. And that's the line you can't cross. Protect the story, but don't try and hurt anyone around you. So that's some points that I wanted to talk about. Um, let's see. The last thing I want to want to share with you here is what the film editor does, and this applies to not only film editing, but I would say pretty much across the board in all creative endeavors. Um, as a film editor, I have to watch all the footage. It takes a lot of time, but I'm only good if I've seen every piece of footage, and then I can make my decisions. When the director comes in and says, do you remember that shot? I have to be able to say yes. And not only that, I have to remember where it is. So being able to see all the footage and organizing everything so I can easily find something is critical. The one sign of like a, of an amateur editor, someone who can't find a, the footage, he's scrolling through bins, he's pulling up shots, everyone's waiting. You can't do that. If you want to work professionally, then you have to be in control and you have to have everything just locked down, totally. Uh, nurture the relationship with the director, it's sacred. In the film world, the director is the, the top person and everyone works to help him tell the story. Our job is to help the director by being in a small room, in a dark room for three or four months, it's usually just me and, and a director, and you have to gain their trust, but also help them tell their story, and you have to respond differently to different personalities. Someone can be very manic, and you have to not take it personally. You can be like, all right, this person's a crazy person, but I understand that, and I gotta stay calm. Some other directors you have to work with and push to move forward, but it's all, it's all important. Find any shot instantly, organization is paramount. I just talked about that. If you don't know where your footage is, you're at a loss, it's not gonna go well. Factor in extra time for renders, exports, errors, and crashes. No matter what you're doing, and this goes for anything, things are gonna go bad. Something's gonna fail on a project, something's gonna fall through, always budget more time, and because of the fact in Premiere Pro I'm not transcoding, I'm in real time, I get to have that benefit all the time. Attempt edits that shouldn't work, you'll be surprised. Also, for any creative person, as soon as you're out of your comfort zone, that's the time something new will happen for you. That's the time something that you tried, that you never tried before, works. So don't do the same thing over and over. You'll get the same result. Try crazy shit and you'll never know what happens. Uh, spend more time on audio. I think the biggest thing in filmmaking is audio is a place that you can really make a difference that will set you aside from all the other people. You could shoot on a 5K, 6K, 12K camera. It may look great, but if it sounds like no one's going to watch it. No one cares. So take that time. In Premiere Pro, we have a lot of new um, audio additions and also Audition, which is part of the package that you can farm out. I can do and I've mastered and mixed feature films inside Premiere Pro without any problem. And I could not do that five years ago, and now I can. And again, staying, under, staying in one program as my hub, and Premiere Pro is my hub, everything I do starts here and finishes here. I start cutting here, I can do the color correction in here, I can take my audio, do it in here, and as you saw, I can go and then deliver a DCP, the industry standard cinema package that you guys will see in the theater. I do it all inside this software, and I've done my last four films on it, and I've been cutting on it for 10 years, so for me, it's a perfect world and perfect meld of all my tools in one place. So that's my presentation, and I want to thank you for coming out this morning. I appreciate it. I know it's early, and if you have any questions, I'll be over here. Now, my name is Vashi Netamansky, and I'm at VashiVisuals.com.